I believe that there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. And that quote comes from James Madison from a speech he gave at the Virginia Convention in 1788. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I will be your host for the next hour. And yes, folks, James Madison certainly hit the nail on the head with that one, because the abridgment of the freedoms of the people by gradual and silent encroachment is very much the way things are done. And it's been this way for a long time. As we see, James Madison made that statement in 1788, and things certainly have not changed to this day. We don't see violence in regard to such things as the New World Order. We don't see this being violently imposed upon the people. What we see is it being achieved through gradual increments and small steps that are taken by those in power. They just like to slip things in under the rug, so to speak, folks, and they often do it in ways that seem completely unrelated. For example, there's a new bill that looks like it's going to go forth in England. It's the Anti-Social Behaviour Crime and Policing Bill, which featured in the Queen's speech earlier in May. And what the bill could effectively do is make homelessness a crime. And so here we have a society which is working as hard as it can to impoverish and discard as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, and to virtually eliminate the middle class from existence and widen the gap between the rich and the poor. And at the same time, we see a bill which may effectively make homelessness a crime, thereby providing clientele for the jail systems which are fast becoming privatised all over the world. Very interesting, in the article in the Huffington Post that describes this bill, someone is quoted as saying that we believe the government has underestimated the potential for abuse of these powers and has failed to introduce sufficient checks and balances. I would go one further than that, folks, and I would say the government knows very well the potential for abuse of these powers which is why it has failed to introduce sufficient checks and balances, because this is all part of the same agenda, namely the impoverishment and control of the global population via mechanisms such as Agenda 21 and the War on Terror, coal seam gas mining and all of the other wonderful things that they are bringing in. But folks, these are all little gradual increments and these are all things that appear on the surface to be unrelated, but really they are all related. And this is why the jail systems are being privatised as well. And you think about it, folks, when it's a privately run jail system, it needs clientele, it's run as a business, it's about bums on seats. So once you get into a privately run jail system, they're not very keen to let you out again because they like to have you in there because they get paid to have you in there. And such a system, folks, as a privately run jail system, not only opens the door for corruption, it quite literally paves the way for it and ensures that such corruption will indeed occur. Because the system itself that would create such a thing as a privately run jail is morally corrupt in its very foundation. And so it starts off bad and then it's pretty well all downhill from there, folks. And that's the problem, is that the system is morally bankrupt at its very core. And so it's very difficult to create anything really meaningful from that. As I've so often mentioned, when you have psychopaths who create a system of government or a system of business or any type of system, any type of hierarchical system, then you find that the morality of the psychopath who created the system is what? permeates throughout the system and quite literally becomes the morality of the system that they've created. And this affects the minds of those who operate within the parameters of such a system in the same manner in which a pathogen affects a body and quite literally nurtures 
whatever sociopathic spark anybody may have in them and rewards sociopathic behavior. And this is very much why society is in the state that it's in. And it's important to account for that and to bear that in mind when looking at the system and in trying to find remedy for any situations that we face. It's important to remember that it is essentially a psychopathic system. And this can be clearly seen by anybody who simply steps back and takes the time to really put things into perspective and view the system as a whole. Because when you do step back and look at it, that's what you see, folks. I mean, all the things the government does, they bring in little laws all the time. They're bringing in new stuff. And all of this stuff is designed to curtail freedoms. I mean, it's presented to us in a manner that we are to believe that it's being done for our protection because our societies are getting so dangerous now that we need all of these new laws and video cameras everywhere and all this stuff we need to protect us. But really, it isn't to protect us, it's to protect the system and to give the police greater powers to enforce every single piece of legislation and every new rule that's given to them. And bear in mind that none of these rules are ever examined for their validity. All the politicians have to do is write something down on a piece of paper and put it in a book with a nice binding on it, and the police will view it as law and they will carry out the will of these politicians and inflict their legislation upon the population without question because that's the mindset police have they can't think that clearly folks and they're not trained to be able to think clearly and objectively they're trained to simply obey authority and that's what they do and they certainly have no problem inflicting that authority upon the general population because the police know they are able to do so because they are essentially above the law themselves and this can be well proven just by a simple observation of the actions of police because what they do mainly, folks, is perform acts of terrorism against the population. Any police officer that's ever used a taser against an unarmed person is a terrorist and they resort to terrorism all the time, folks. Bear in mind that terrorism is defined as violence or the threat of violence carried out against civilians as a means of coercion. That is the definition given to us in the Oxford English Dictionary. And those are the actions that the police perform against the people they are sworn to protect every single day. And it's extremely disturbing when we see such actions being carried out against people who have been impoverished by the system and have been forced into a situation of homelessness. And now we see that any people that are discarded by the system like that with these new laws that are being trialled in the UK these people can now be incarcerated within the prison system. This will, of course, split up the family unit, send the mother off to a woman's prison, send the father off to prison, and put the child in care somewhere as a ward of the state. And this is very much what the government would like. They like to have people under their thumb as early as possible. And, of course, it's very difficult for people to go and find somewhere to live outside of the city because the governments are going out of their way to destroy the water table in the countryside from actions such as coal seam gas mining. And so this also effectively pushes people towards concentrated population areas, which is what the government wants. That's part of the Agenda 21 plan, folks, is to have most of the country return to nature and to just have the people in concentrated population areas where they can be looked after by the nanny state. And folks, really, when you look at it, just the fear of being incarcerated for being homelessness, this is psychological terrorism that's enforced upon the people. And we see this from every angle coming from the government all the time. Quite literally, it's terrorism. We're living in societies where different types of terrorism are forced upon us every day because... Everybody in our society is forced into a position where they are living in a state of fear. Very interesting, the recent attacks we saw in London, they actually called this terrorism as well, someone being stabbed to death or hacked to death in the street. And of course, this isn't a good look, folks, getting hacked to death in the street. It's not a good look hacking someone to death in the street, and it's not the sort of thing you want to see when you're out doing your afternoon shopping. 
But it's interesting that they should refer to it as terrorism and view it as something similar to 9-11. But by doing so, they have, in point of fact, pointed out to you that we see terrorism around us all the time on a daily basis, and we don't really perceive what it is, but actually it is terrorism, folks. I mean, I'm sure the guy who was being hacked to death was quite terrified at the time, and I'm sure the people who were watching on were also quite terrified. And it's important that we see what this really is, folks, and realize that terrorism isn't just mad religious extremists strapping bombs to themselves. Terrorism is, in fact, any type of psychological trauma that is inflicted upon you. And it's important to understand that acts of terrorism are not just carried out by perpetrators on the street, and in actual fact, the acts of violence that the police perform against the citizens every single day are in fact acts of terrorism. The act of threatening people with incarceration should they become homeless is an act of terrorism. The act of telling people they could be fined or arrested for not driving with both hands on the wheel is also an act of terrorism, folks. The act of threatening people with incarceration should they be caught in possession of a plant is an act of terrorism. And the thing is that what people need to understand is that every time the government uses violence to enforce one of their rules, what they are doing is performing an act of terrorism against the people in order to coerce the people into compliance. And this is the very definition of terrorism. And this is what we see from our elected trustees on a daily basis. And they get away with it because people just don't seem to notice. And even if people do notice, they don't speak out about it. They don't say anything. They just turn a blind eye and think, oh, we better not get involved. And they look the other way and they walk away. But you need to get involved, folks. Whenever you see a police officer perform an act of violence, you need to video it, put it on the internet, put it on YouTube, get it out to people, lodge formal complaints about it, and tell everybody you know about what's going on. Because it is by inflicting these little gradual steps upon us that we are getting locked down from every conceivable angle. And it's just continuing, and it will continue to do so until people start making some noise about it. So people absolutely have to start getting involved in their community. We've got to start putting things back on track and put police back in their correct position as protectors of society rather than enforcers of corporate regulations, which is what they are fast becoming. I mean, sure, they do do other stuff on the side as well. They will attend road accidents and do things when people are injured, but only because they have to. They don't really like doing it. But they're not nice people anymore, folks. Have you ever stopped and tried to ask a cop for directions on the side of the road these days? Like... We used to do, back in the old days, you know, if you were lost, you'd stop and you'd ask a policeman. You stop and you try to ask a policeman for anything these days, and they look at you like they want to arrest you just because you're wasting their time by talking to them. They really are the rudest, most unfriendly, and most intimidating individuals you could possibly imagine these days. It's a far cry from the friendly police officers we used to have when I was a child. And people need to notice this. They need to notice the change that's happened in our society and the change that's come about from these people, the different mindset of the cops today than what we had when we were a kid. Unfortunately, many of the cops today have also grown up on television and they believe that this fake reality they're presented with is actually real. They're trained to act melodramatically and overreact in every situation, and so that's what they do. And it's very, very disturbing to see. But again, folks, it continues simply because the population are too intimidated and too timid to actually say anything and actually speak out and make a little bit of noise about it. People are too timid to get involved in their communities anymore. And that's really what we need to happen. And there'll be people out there to be saying, look, that's all very well, Max. You can tell us we need to rein the police back in and put them back in their correct position. We need to get involved in our community. But how do we get involved? And folks, really, it's got to come down to grassroots action. It's got to come down to you having local meetings and going to council meetings and maybe even just having gatherings once a week where you talk to people and explain to them what's going on in the world. And changing the approach that most people use when they're standing up against the system. I mean, protests and all this sort of stuff, it's all very well to have a protest. 
you know, things such as protest marches and stuff, but it doesn't really do anything unless you come out of that protest march with a concise plan of action, something that you're going to be continuing from that point, some action that will be ongoing from the march. It was just getting out there and marching with a placard in the belief that you're actually making a difference. Well, you're not making a difference, folks. You're showing the people in the town that there is certain individuals that are willing to stand up against the system and you're performing an act of solidarity with those who are there attending the march with you. But once the march is over, nothing has really changed and so you need to have an ongoing plan. And not just speak out against the system with violent rhetoric, but actually start taking action against the system by having enough power in your community that you can refuse to comply with the system. I mean, if you've got a whole community that refuse to comply with the regulations of local council, then there's nothing the local council could do about it. The council can only enforce its regulations when it's only a few people who refuse to comply then they just make an example of them to the rest of the community and use that action to intimidate the rest of the community and keep them locked into fear-based mind control so they won't stand up. And so that's why you need to have this communal strength before you stand up. You need to build these ties with the people around you. And I've been saying this on the air now for almost six years, folks. I've been trying to point out to people the need to build strength in your community, the need to have these strong ties with the people around you, the need to respect each other. This is why I've gone through the nature of reality so many times, because I believe that once people understand how reality really works, they can begin to forgive and respect themselves. And then forgiveness and respect for others comes by default from that point. That's why I've tended to beat the same drum on these shows for so long, folks, because I really don't think there's any action we can take outside the power of community that is going to bring about any effective change. I don't think there's any point in me becoming a politician and entering into the political arena and believing that I can change the system from within the parameters provided for me by the system because the system is designed to protect itself. It's not designed to allow anybody who's functioning within it to ever bring about any effective change. I really truly believe it can only be done by people who are willing to step above the system, and that will only happen by people who have realized their own power and have stopped externalizing the control in their lives, handing control to other people, it can only be done by people who see the worth in themselves and the worth in the people around them and who are prepared to put down their aggrievements and to realize that there is a bigger picture here that we need to look at and are prepared to stand up and make a difference in the world. I mean, I've said so many times we are all custodians on this planet. That's what we're here to do. We're here to look after the future for our kids. We're here to leave the world in a better state than how we found it. And that includes taking control of the government and taking control of our public trustees and reining this police state in and putting it back on track. Really, it's just the honourable thing to do. I mean, the other option is to just allow things to continue the way they are unchecked. And if we do that, then the future that we're allowing to be created is not going to be a future that people are going to be able to live in with any degree of comfort or security at all. Because we have an oligarchy that is in control of this planet, folks, a corporate oligarchy, and we are fast heading towards a totally corporate-controlled government. I mean, we have a corporate-controlled government already, but even the facade of government is becoming flimsy, and it's getting to the point now where we don't even really need the facade of government, and what we will end up with is a corporate dictatorship, and it will be a corporate dictatorship that people actually ask for, because they will eventually get tired of the government messing up and the government taking their rights away and all of the problems that the government creates, and they will trust in corporatism. And they'll do so because they believe the financial system is real, they believe the economy is real, they believe in the paper-based reality that's been inflicted over the human psyche. And of course you can't blame them, folks, because they're indoctrinated into believing this. Many people cannot imagine a world without commerce. They simply cannot imagine 
how people would be able to function were it not for the attachment of commercial value upon their actions and upon every item that exists. And there is value attached to everything, folks. There's an economic value attached to every single thing in this planet. Water, air, trees, soil, rocks, and life itself, everything has an economic value attached to it. And people cannot imagine how we could function without that because they've been trained to always think with their left brain. That's the only way they can view reality. And it's very, very difficult to help these people see a larger picture of reality because, unfortunately, they've been so educated in a left brain system that they're just not able to think that way. That's what left brain education does, folks. And the more you get of it and the more letters and numbers you get behind your name, the more you seem to be locked into this mindset where you're not able to use your right brain. And so such people simply are not able to view the world holistically. They're trained to always think in language and to always think within the realms of Newtonian physics. And that's just a reality that they're locked into. So it's very, very difficult to reach these people. And so what we have to do really is to lead by example in what we do. And that's why any change has to come from grassroots. It has to come from the individual changing their own perspective and applying it to the world around them. And I know that sounds easy for those out there listening to this who have already changed their perspective, but we all know how difficult it can be to crack that shell with others and convince them to even question their perspective, let alone change it. Now, I know exactly how difficult this can be, folks. I have a sister, my eldest sister, the eldest child in our family, who is so locked into the matrix that it beggars belief. And she will not question anything she sees on the television. She will not question anything the government tells her to be true or any rule the government inflicts upon her because she just believes that is the way the world is. And there's nothing that I can do to convince her to think outside of the box even a little bit. And if I even attempt to, then her ego kicks in, she gets fully on the attack and will not back down because that's what people do, folks. When someone comes along and poses a question to them which causes them to confront their belief system, then their ego kicks in, they see it as a personal affront against themselves and they lash out, sometimes quite violently in response to someone simply posing some simple questions to them. And it's a very programmed response that many people have when brought face-to-face with information which causes them to question their reality. And unfortunately, that's one of the biggest hurdles that we face in bringing this information to people. It's one of the biggest hurdles we face in changing the world, is just getting people to break out of their own false egos and own egotistical beliefs of how the world should be. And again, it's it's difficult because you can't blame people for thinking this way because it's the way they've been trained to think. I mean, people have quite literally been subject to mind control since the moment of birth. You know, it gets fed to them and indoctrinated into them as soon as they start school, but they're getting it even before then because the people in the family that they are living in, are generally programmed as much as everybody else. And so they are receiving programming from their parents and their peers and their siblings from virtually the day they are born. And the human mind, especially a child's mind, is like a sponge. It soaks up all the information, folks. And so by the time children get to the stage where they're going to preschool, they are already quite programmed into a particular version of reality that society wants them to have generally speaking. And so it's very difficult to break down these barriers with people. It's very difficult to be able to convince people to at least question whether things should be this way and to just think a little bit outside of the box. It's very difficult to get them to do it. And that's why it's important for the individual out there listening to this who is already awake to lead by example in what you do, because that is the best way to convince people to question their own version of reality. You can't come along like a raving conspiracy theorist and scream fear at them. 
because you're just doing the same thing. It's all fear-based mind control. You're simply attempting to move them from one type of fear into another type of fear. And very often, you might be coming up to someone who's quite content in their life, and suddenly you wake them up and put them into a state of fear. And that's not a good thing. You need to be able to, rather than simply waking someone up to the fact that the world is not the way they think it is, to be able to show them that there is something better that they can do and that there is another way that they can do things and simply plant seeds in their mind which will cause them to question why things were the way they believed them to be previously. And through this process, you will find that these people will wake up themselves and they'll suddenly look around them and they'll go, oh my God, what was I swimming in? And this has come about simply because you were leading by example in what you were doing in your own life and you were showing them that there's a better way. That way people get to wake up on their own, folks, and that's the best type of wakefulness. Because real truth is not told, real truth must be realized, and it's important for us to understand that. That we all had that aha moment in our own lives when we realized things for ourselves. And that was probably the most significant moment in our lives, and that moment is what motivated us to do what we do now. And it's important that we help nurture that moment in other people by leading, by example, in what we do ourselves. We can all make a difference, folks, as soon as we realize the power that we have. But we tend to externalize our power. We tend to externalize our wants and needs. We externalize ourselves into the stuff that we own. We believe that success is the accumulation of physical stuff, And we neglect ourselves, we neglect our families, we neglect our lives because we believe that our families will be better off and looked after more if we collect more stuff to decorate reality around them. And very often we miss out on themselves and we miss out on the need to lead by example in what we do. And the example we set for our children should not be one of collecting stuff. It should be one of spiritual evolvement and good custodianship. It should be one of respect and honor, and we need to instill into those who come after us a need to be good custodians, because it's important, folks. It's important that we pay attention to what's going on around us, and we realize the power that we have, and what we can do, what each of us can do in the short time that we are given in this reality because I believe that each of us can make a difference if we just apply ourselves. But the first step to that is to understand what reality is. The first step to that is to discover your own personal power. But I think it's break time here, folks, so I'll have to leave it there for now, and we'll go and have a break. Thank you for joining me on the air today, and I will speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, when looking at this system, folks, and looking at the societies that we live in, it's important that people understand that there's no good fighting against it because you're fighting against the cloud. And once you discover the realities of the world, then it's important that you don't get sucked into the program of the fight as well. You've got to understand that there's so many programs running out there. I mean, this is a very difficult thing for a lot of people to come to terms with. I look at it this way, folks. I see myself as an electrical being, so I think of it as a computer reality. It's just a metaphor that I use for myself. So imagine yourself living in a virtual reality where you are quite literally a frequency of energy because this is very much true anyway. You are an electrical being even more than you are a biological being. I've done whole shows about this. But all... Electrical beings can be programmed to act in a certain way. All electrical frequencies can be programmed to act in a certain way, and you are no different, and you can be programmed to act in a certain way. Very often, when people jump to defense of their belief system, the way I was describing earlier in the show with my sister, this is a program. This is a programmed response. People are taught to view any confront to their belief system as an attack against ego, an attack against themselves, a personal attack. 
And so very often they respond in a very violent manner. Maybe only verbally violent, but it is still a very aggressive response that you get from these people. And these are programmed responses. And when people wake up to the reality of how the world is run, very often they also go into a programmed response and they go into the program of the fight. And the fight becomes these people's lives. And very often it's all about the fight because finally they've found someone they can point the finger at and blame for the problems that they're having in the world. And look, this is true to a certain degree. There are certain people that have done certain things that have made life very difficult for the rest of us. But ultimately we've got to look at why this continues, why it's perpetuated. And the reason it's perpetuated is because people don't understand their own personal power. See, again, it's an externalization, folks. You're externalizing the control mechanism and you're blaming someone else when really the fault lies with ourselves and our failure to reclaim that which is ours, which is our heritage, our place on this planet. It's our willingness to comply to a corrupt corporate paper-based reality. And again, you can't blame people for doing this because they're trained to believe that they have to. And they're trained to believe that this paper-based reality is real. So we need to find a way of cracking the shell for these people in the right way. And this is why it always comes back to discovering your own personal power and leading by example. I know I beat this drum a lot, folks, but I'm just trying to explain to you the necessity of doing this because that's where it has to start. Because... There's no silver bullet. So many people are looking for the silver bullet. Come and do this. We'll create this alternate society. This is our silver bullet. Really, all you're doing is turning your back on the world and allowing it to decay around you, and it'll come and eat you up later. So there's no good creating an alternate society unless it's going to be an alternate society that exists within this society with the intention of creating ripples and changing the larger society around us. Or it's come and join my cult, or it's come and think in this way, or come and do these meditations, or do this or do that. But it's always an external thing, when really it's got to come down to the individual changing their perspective of reality and how they interact with reality themselves. It's got to come down to personal power. See, every time we go to someone else for a solution, every time we go to an alternate community for a solution, or any time we go to a guru for a solution, or read a self-help book, well, it's called self-help, folks. Why would you be reading a self-help book if it's about self-help? You're supposed to do it yourself. You're not supposed to get the information from a book because the information doesn't exist in a book. All the book can tell you is the journey that another person took to get to where they got in the hope that maybe that will help you look at things a little bit differently. But even when you read these so-called self-help books or you go to see a self-help guru, it's important for you to understand that this person is offering you their perspective and you have to take from that what works for you and find your own way through because it's self-help and freedom is self-responsibility, self-empowerment, self-knowledge, self-acceptance. And through self-acceptance, of course, comes acceptance of others. The thing is that there are different levels of wakefulness. And that's the problem. That's what many people don't see. I was actually on a show, Vinnie Eastwood show the other day, with Lennon Honor. And Lennon made a wonderful analogy when he said that very often people wake up from the dream, which is the matrix, the false society that we all live in, but they simply enter into a new dream and they can't see that they've simply gone from one dream to the next. And that's really a beautiful way of putting it because there are definitely different levels of wakefulness. There's many people out there in the so-called truth community or what I prefer to call the alternate research community who claim wakefulness and yet they still have stuff with other people. They can't see what reality is. They can't see how it works. They can't see that each individual in this reality is a completely unique perspective, is simply a vibration of frequency 
that ultimately comes from the same sources themselves. They never really looked at quantum physics. They never really looked at how matter works and questioned how reality functions. And they see any affront to their own perspective as a personal attack against themselves. And so they maintain the fight with other people within the alternate research community who are actually speaking out and doing the same thing and saying the same thing and trying things from their own personal perspective, which is what we have to do. And all the people out there doing alternate communities and stuff, I mean, I think it's great. I think it's great for people to become self-sufficient and get away from this system in any way they can. But what I'm saying is that in doing that, it's, it's very important to still maintain your ties within the community and maintain connections to people within the community so that you can lead by example in what you're doing and create ripples and change the larger community around you via your actions. Because if you turn your back on it and simply go away and ignore it, it's just going to get bigger. So you can't do that. That's the problem that many people don't see, is the need to continue to confront the system but in the right way. And confronting it via non-compliance is the best way. And building an alternate community that works and doing it within this community is a great mechanism to do that. That's my only problem with alternate communities, folks, is that they tend to want to just go away and turn their back on this one and pretend it doesn't exist. And I think that's a very, very dangerous thing to do. I think we need to start making these changes that we want within the communities that we already have. And we need to understand that we have the power to do this simply because of who and what we are. Because we are mankind. We created this society. We created this system. And if the system is ceasing to serve us in the way that it should, then we have the ability to step above that, should we choose to do so. But of course, it's a dangerous thing to do because those who control the system are psychopathic and can get quite violent when their control is threatened, which is why we need the power of the community around us to step up with us. And this can only be achieved once we learn to respect each other, which can only be achieved once we respect ourselves, and as I've said so often, folks, this can only happen once we really understand how reality works. So this is why I keep beating the same drum, and this is why it always comes back to this. Because any remedy that we wish to implement, even if you were of the mindset that you wish to enter politics and do it from that platform, well, okay, you probably could, as long as you entered politics from the perspective that I've just offered, as long as you entered it from the perspective of understanding how reality works and from the perspective and the knowledge that you are entering into a fictional system with the intention of exposing the fiction for what it is, that would be the only way you'd be able to actually affect any positive change from within the political spectrum. And I would suggest that to do such a thing would probably be a very dangerous manoeuvre as well, because once you enter into that arena, there are people who will simply not allow you to do what you want to do. There are a lot of people that are programmed in that system, and they will not let you perform the actions that you want to perform. And if you do, they will tie you up in red tape, and you've got to understand that they also control the media, and they can spin whatever story they like about you. And the gullible public out there, will simply buy what the media tells them, generally. Most people do. Most people just believe what the news tells them. These trends are, of course, changing these days. Many people are finding that the information from the mainstream media is not as reliable as they once thought, and they're getting their news from alternate means. But nonetheless, many people do buy into what the mainstream media tells them. And... There are still enough people in the world that buy into everything that television tells them that the government is still in a position where it can basically cook up any story it wants and it can get the people to go along with it because there's still enough general consensus amongst a large enough section of the population that the government can be trusted. And so we do have some difficult hurdles to overcome, folks, which is why I believe leading by example is the best thing you can do. If you're a helpful person and you talk to people around you and you get involved in your community then I believe you can make a difference. And start helping people, folks, because it does change reality for you. When you start giving to people and start helping people around you, 
it really, really changes reality. The field changes, the energy changes in people. And what you get back from the field around you changes. It, it all becomes different. Reality just becomes different when you're a giving person. And when you start giving of yourself and being kind and considerate and treating other people as yourself, you'll find that there's a real reward in doing that. And you'll find that it's, it's really your natural state. Because as I've often said, I believe that mankind are naturally nurturing creatures. I believe that we are naturally caring and nurturing and helpful creatures by default. If we were left to our own devices, that's the way we would be. People may challenge that statement and say, no, we've left kids to their own devices and we've seen that hierarchies always developed. And I would suggest, well, that's because 1% to 3% of the population are usually born psychopaths. And it's through this psychopathic mentality that the hierarchy develops. And I believe that that's why ancient cultures had mechanisms in place to deal with this phenomena. And look, I'm not saying that if you're involved in any type of hierarchy, I mean, if you're the boss of a business or something, then you're a psychopath. I mean, of course, we live in a hierarchical society. That's the way it's constructed. So we are forced to operate within those type of parameters if we are to survive within this society. I'm simply pointing out how hierarchical mentality develops within people. And I know people that run businesses anyway that are very lovely people and very helpful, very kind and a pleasure to work for. I know people that run small businesses and their employees have said that they will die at that business. They will never leave the business and go anywhere else because they like working for the people that they work for. So it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody who runs a business is a psychopath. And in fact, quite the opposite, because what it does is it shows how well a community can develop, even if it is a small business community, if people act in compassion within that business. And if it isn't a psychopathic mentality that's running the business, it creates a nurturing environment for the people, whereby all the people who work within the business find it very beneficial to be there. It improves their life. Because they have that communal spirit around them, they have that helpfulness from the company that they work for. And the company is there simply as a mechanism to create that small community within the community. And it's leading by example in what it does. So in many ways, your small business could be something that does this on a business level and starts creating ripples in the business world and start stepping away from the system in every little way that it can. If it can't do it in big ways, many people can't in big ways in companies, but they can step away in small ways. They can do it by simply being helpful to their customers. They can do it by being helpful to their employees and by being helpful and supportive of the businesses around them and the other people that they know that are running businesses. And then those people will soon see that there are benefits to giving. There are benefits to thinking outside of the box. There are benefits to letting your natural, nurturing, caring mechanisms come to fruition within you because they're there. We have this innate parenting ability within us. I mean, I call it a parenting ability. It's more like a nurturing ability, a nurturing spirit within us. I believe that virtually everybody has it unless they're born a psychopath. And again, 1% to 3% of people are born psychopathic. And those that are not born psychopathic, even those that are nurturing and caring, there is still that dark side that exists within everybody, the predator mind, if you will, that exists within all people, that will create fear, that will create competition, that will put thoughts into people's heads, that will seek to nurture that little spark within everybody that may be even slightly sociopathic. And that's what this society is also designed to do, is designed to nurture and develop and reward sociopathic behavior. If you can be ruthless in business and view everything that involves commerce as business, then you will be a successful person. But when you have the entire human experience reduced to commerce, when you have people's ability to be able to put a roof over their heads and food on the table reduced to commerce, and your whole goal is extracting wealth from the people around you and to 
view everything as commerce, then you're viewing life as commerce and suddenly life becomes expendable in order to support an economic model. And this is the height of sociopathy. And that's what this society has nurtured more than anything, folks. It's a mechanism that has been designed to support fictional digits on a screen and a paper-based reality, a world in which everybody has to collect paper with little pictures on it in order to pay to be alive, and whereby if you do not have this paper or the ability to collect this paper, then you are expendable. It's a society that's been created to apparently service the needs of mankind, which has made mankind the most discarded thing within its parameters and the most expendable thing within its parameters, and humankind will be altogether expelled from existence in order to support an economic model if things are allowed to continue in the direction that they are. And unfortunately, much of society will allow it to go down this direction unless we, those who are awake, can find mechanisms by which to wake these people up and to lead by example and show them there is a better way. And look, it's no good screaming out about the satanic New World Order and all of the demons and terrible stuff that's coming to the world unless you're offering solutions, folks, and even viewing it as a satanic New World Order again externalizes everything. It suddenly puts the controlling hand off-world into the realms of biblical Armageddon and creationist myths. It totally removes mankind of the ability to bring about any effective change. You know, Satan is a Roman invention. It's a biblical creation designed to externalize the control system and make people believe that there is nothing they can do to change the world. But they can, because the whole system isn't run by this terrible satanic beast as a mechanism with which to wage war against the religious god. It's a creation of fiction that's been created by the imagination of humankind. Even if there is a guiding force that's created it, which I believe that there is, this is what I refer to as the predator mind, then it has still been created via the actions of humankind. It's by usurping our power of intention and our power of imagination that has been the mechanism by which this system has been created. And I think it's important for us to realize that there's no good screaming and pointing the finger at the satanic New World Order because that does not solve anything and it simply exacerbates the problem because it removes the ability of solution from the hands of the people. And I believe the solution is very clear, and it's readily available should we just choose to participate in the world around us. Now, I know I say this a lot, folks, participate in the world around you, and people go, well, how do I participate? Well, you do it by respecting yourself and by respecting others. You do it by breaking down the barriers between you and other people. You do it by forgiving yourself and forgiving others and living your life in like cash. That's how you do it, folks. I know it sounds simplistic, but it works. You know, the simple solutions are the best solutions. You know, when it's simple, you know it's right. When it's complex, it's not. It's not a solution if it's complex. If it's so complex that people can't understand it, if there's forms to fill out and there's all this stuff that has to be taken care of, then it's not a solution. The real solution is the simplest method, and the simplest method is for people to change their perspective and to start respecting themselves and respecting those around them. And as I've said, folks, I can even respect the psychopaths and I can forgive the psychopaths. They won't allow me to, but hey, I can forgive them. And if we have to take them out, well, that's fine. I have no problem with taking them out, but I won't do it with animosity in my heart. I'll do it with forgiveness and sorrow in my heart. Because as I've said, I can't understand what it would be like to be born a psychopath. I can't understand how difficult life must be for these people. They may have all of this physical wealth around them, but their souls must be thoroughly empty and void of any real understanding of what it means to be human. And I feel sorry for them for that state. And I can forgive them for what they've done, and I don't wish retribution on any of them. But by the same token, I will defend myself if I'm seen to be under an attack. And at the moment, folks, what I perceive is that the whole 
of mankind is under attack from the actions of these people. At least we're seeing a global march against Monsanto, and this is a good thing, as long as positive action comes out of the march, as long as people don't think that the march was good and made a difference just because they marched, as long as there are actions that are pursued post-march, then it will be a good thing. But I think it's time that we all start taking action, folks. That's why I do what I do. I continue to speak out because I believe it needs to be done. Because there is quite literally a war going on. It's going on right now. It's being waged by the ruling hand, the global elite, if we should even call them that, those powers who believe they be. And it's being waged against the people of the world. But it's a quiet war using silent weapons. The weapons that are used are biological, electromagnetic and indoctrinational, educational, if you will, in nature. But the most effective weapon of all is control of people's minds. Control of what people believe or do not believe is possible. And most especially control of what people believe they are, how much power people believe they have, because that is the most dangerous thing that this system faces. That is its Achilles heel, its one flaw, is the people themselves. It's our ability to create a new reality any time we seek to do it. Which is why much of the truth movement or alternative research movement is so damaging, folks. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. A lot of the people out there do so much waving and finger-pointing, but they do not empower the people. And by giving the system too much credit, and by giving those who control the planet too much credit, they are removing from the people the ability to ever bring about any positive change because they are removing the power from the people. They are externalizing the control mechanism too much and they are portraying it as this all-powerful system. But really, it's just a system that exists on paper and it's a system that is run by people who are just like everybody else. And that's where the flaw lies. That's the Achilles heel, folks. That's the weak spot. That's the chink in the armour. Because we created this whole thing through our imagination. And if we were ever to discover the power that we have to simply stand up and say no because we've learnt to respect each other, then the whole system will come crashing down like a house of cards. That's the weak point, folks. And we can do... All the stuff that we do, we can point our finger as much as we like. We can scream bloody murder at those who control us. But until we're prepared to put down the barriers that we hold with our neighbours and the barriers that keep us divided from each other, then we're never going to achieve anything. We're never going to be able to bring about any effective change. We've got to start nurturing ourselves and nurturing those around us. We've got to break down these barriers between the sexes, break down the divisions that have been created in the family unit and we've got to have strong communities in order to do this and that's why I focus so heavily on this throughout these shows and why I've stuck on it for the last five or six years folks because I really do believe that is our way home that is our ticket out of here if you will but look we've reached the end of the show here folks we've completely run out of time again it does come by very quick there's a lot more I wanted to talk about but I'll have to save it for next week. Thank you for spending this time with me today. Thank you for all the supportive emails. Thank you for your continued support of the show. Thank you to anybody who's ever made a contribution to the website. And by the way, folks, I've had to stop my candida antifungal diet that I was on while I was away on some speaking engagements. It just wasn't possible to be able to continue the diet on airport food and in the traveling that I was doing. And so I'm going to start on that again this week from the very beginning and actually do the diet properly and I'll let you know how I go with that. But I am out of time, folks. It's been a pleasure speaking to you again. I will look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take care until then. In La Keshe.